In this lecture, I want to first of all give you a, a resume of the procedures for determining dynamic specification and then illustrate the use of those procedures in a model of the demand for consumer non-durables in uh, Canada. The model that we're looking at is one where we have a vector of polynomials in the lag operator of maximal order m operating on a vector of k plus 1 variables xt. And that is equal to an error term vt. And we want to contrast that model, which is the unrestricted model, with one which has rth order autocorrelation uh, generating the error process. So that we have the scalar polynomial rho of L of order R into alpha of L, which is a vector of polynomials now of order denoted by L. And if this is a special case of the re unrestricted model above, then R plus L would be equal to M. that is equal to another error at silent t. And the problem we're addressing is either determine the values of R and L. And once you've done that, it implies the value of M. M is the maximal order of dynamics in the model. And one way of looking at our problem is that we can determine the number of common factors, R, and the number of or order of systematic dynamics in the model, L. If we determine both R and L, then the sum of those gives us the order of dynamics as a whole, and that's equal to M. Alternatively, we could view our problem as one of determining the maximal order of dynamics M and either R or L. And once we've determined M and R, that immediately implies that we've determined L, the order of systematic dynamics. And in fact, these two ways of looking at the general problem lead to two different uh, sequential testing procedures. But before I go on to discuss those two, I want to consider a slightly simpler case where on a priori ground we know the value either of R or L. And I'll take the case where we know the value of L. And remember that the hat or circumflex is used to denote the value that we determine for that particular parameter. And the bar denotes the maintained maximum value for it. And in this case, we're saying that we know uh, the value of L. Therefore, the value that we determine will, in fact, be equal to the value we first specify, um, L bar. So if we're in that situation, the problem is very much simpler. In fact, we now have the hypotheses corresponding to R hat being of orders 1, 2, through to the maximum that's possible, which would be M bar minus L bar. The hypotheses corresponding to these particular values for the order of the autoregressive process, or the number of common factors, are in fact uniquely ordered. And those are the only hypotheses we're interested in in this particular uh, problem, where we know a priori the value of L. So that in this case, we can immediately use the optimal sequential testing procedure to determine R. Well, what does that consist of? Well, it consists of testing the sequence of hypotheses 
first of all, that the um, coefficient rho r bar, so that's the coefficient out of the polynomial rho of L corresponding to the r bar lag, is equal to 0. If we don't reject that, we then go on to consider the hypothesis that rho r bar and also rho r bar minus 1 are jointly equal to 0. So that the order of the auto regression, if this hypothesis is true, is now maximally equal to r bar minus 2. And we can go on in that uh, sequence of hypotheses until we would come to the joint hypothesis, which is rho r bar is equal to rho r bar minus 1, all of which are equal to rho 1, and that in turn is equal to 0. And that corresponds to, if we accept this hypothesis, then we're accepting that there's zero order autocorrelation. And that's a uniquely ordered uh, set of hypotheses so that we can apply Anderson's optimal sequential testing procedure to determine the value of R. So as a result of applying the optimal sequential testing procedure, we get R hat. And at that stage, we solve the problem. We've assumed that we knew the value of L. We've now determined um, the value of R, and that's the end of the problem. And in this particular case, we know that because this is the optimal sequential testing procedure to determine R, that asymptotically is a, very, is a powerful testing procedure without any reservations. We could reverse the roles of R and L and assume that we knew the value of R and test sequentially de to determine the value of L, the order of systematic dynamics, as opposed to the order of error dynamics. And the structure of the problem is just the same. Notice that the most general model in this context for this sequence of hypotheses is the model with autoregression of order r bar. So that we set off from the most general model which has autoregression of order r bar, then consider whether it should be r bar minus 1, and so on until we come to the hypothesis that um, the order of autoregression is 1 and then finally 0. And that, in fact, is the opposite uh, testing procedure from the one that's often used in practice. In fact, if we think of this situation, we could describe common practice as being the assumption that L is 0, in other words, that we have a static model, and then testing whether we need autocorrelation. And in particular, the tests for R being non-zero are usually done via Durbin-Watson test statistics, for example. So that in terms of this sequence of hypotheses, the common practice as I'm describing it starts at the other end of the sequence. And first of all tests whether R is 1 via a Durbin-Watson test statistic. If you find that you should have first order serial correlation in the errors, you would then re-estimate the model, which is now first order dynamic, and then perhaps compute the Durbin-Watson test statistic again, which in effect is then testing whether R should be equal to 2. And from this analysis, we can see that certainly it doesn't correspond to the optimal uh, sequential testing procedure. However, if we are to consider this problem in general, it's very unlikely that we would know either the value of L or R a priori. So that we have to consider the situation where we want to <coughs> simultaneously determine those two values. <coughs> 
And following the two descriptions of our problem, A and B, previously, I want to consider two reasonable procedures. The first procedure, uh, one, consists of a first stage. And both the procedures that I'm going to consider, in fact, are two-stage testing procedures. The first stage of the first procedure seeks to determine the value of the, or the order of the autoregressive error process. And we know that that must be less than or equal to the maintained maximum order of dynamics in the model. We also know that it's going to be non-negative. Well, this, as a problem, is uniquely ordered. And the hypotheses here correspond. I'm not going to be able to write out the form of the restrictions you're testing, because the form uh, is a series of nonlinear restrictions, which are quite complicated to formulate. But it corresponds, first of all, to the testing as to whether r is equal to 1. In other words, whether there's a first order autoregressive error process. And then if we accept that there's a common one common factor or an autoregressive error process of order 1, we then go on to test, in fact, whether there's a second common factor. And the common factor analysis is because what we're doing comparing this factorized representation of the polynomial with the unrestricted polynomials. If this representation is valid, we're saying that the theta of L polynomials in that vector of polynomials have a common factor, and that common factor is this scalar polynomial rho of L. Once we insert the order of that scalar polynomial, because we can write that polynomial as the product of its roots, or expressions involving its roots, what in effect we're doing here is, in attempting to determine r, we're attempting to determine how many common factors theta of L has. So that this sequence of hypotheses is, first of all, testing whether theta of L has one common factor. Secondly, if you don't reject that, you then test whether it's got two common factors. And that series goes on down to the most restricted case, which is that there are uh, m bar common factors. Here we can complicate the discussion um, somewhat by allowing the lags on different variables in the model to differ. And if we do that, instead of using that as the most restricted case, where m with the bar above denotes the maximal order of lag in theta of L, we could use the m with the bar underneath, where we're now using or we'll have to introduce a new notation that m bar j is the maintained maximal lag for the variable j. So that we have the set of variables in the vector xt, which are, in fact, yt and zt. We've got k variables in zt. So there are k plus 1 variables altogether. So that j is going to vary from 1 through to k plus 1. For each one of those variables separately, we can specify a maintained maximal lag. We can then uh, consider m with the bar underneath as being the minimum over j of the mj bars. 
And when we're looking for common factors, the highest order of common factor can never be greater than the lowest of these orders for lags for any individual variable. And that's what we're saying at this point. And just to complete the notation, the m with the bar above is the max over j of the mj bars. As m bar with the bar above has always been the maximal order of lag in theta of L. So that in that situation where we're allowing the lags on the different variables to differ, this is the uniquely ordered set of hypotheses that we want to consider. And again, we use the optimal sequential testing procedure to determine that. But in fact, we can effect this sequence of tests by using Sargon's program known as COMFAC for common factor. And he's developed an algorithm and had a computer program written to implement the algorithm for performing the tests of these common factor restrictions. If you set off with unrestricted vectors of uh, polynomials, theta of L, and you want to test a sequence of hypotheses of this form, namely that those unrestricted vector polynomials have common factors, then you can use Sargon's algorithm. And the great attraction of it is that the only estimates that you need, because the algorithm is based on the Wald principle, are the totally unrestricted estimates. In other words, the only estimates needed are the unrestricted estimates of theta of L with the maximal lag m bar. And the model there is of that form, so it's completely linear. And we could either use ordinary squares estimates or, alternatively, instrumental variables if we were worried about uh, simultaneity problems. So that using this approach, we have a very simple method of generating our unrestricted estimates. We then have a program available for solving what is a complicated testing problem. That is stage A of the procedure. And at the end of that, we've determined our hat. But also, we've determined the order of systematic dynamics. In other words, the order of the alpha of L polynomials, the maximal order of those. And that, in fact, would be equal to m bar with the bar underneath minus the order of autoregression, or the number of common factors we've just determined. And that comes about because we needn't now consider the hypotheses of the form alpha m bar minus r hat equals 0. Because these are the coefficients on the maximal lag available for the alphas now that we've determined r hat and m bar has been specified a priori. The, these would be the coefficients of the longest lag in the alpha. A test of that, and also moving on to testing if that's not rejected, m bar minus r hat is equal to alpha m bar minus r hat minus 1, the joint equal to 0, is not needed. And the reason why that sequence of tests is not needed is if any one of these hypotheses were true, 
then the coefficients in the alpha, when we uh, look at the corresponding entries in the theta uh, coefficients, are zeros. Therefore, what we're able to say is that the theta uh, values at this lag have a common factor, and the common factor corresponds to a zero root. If the lag doesn't occur in the model, then we can represent that as a common factor to all variables with a zero root. So that if these hypotheses are true, then they will have been picked up as uh, common factors. And the roots, when we evaluate them for some of those common factors, are going to be zero. So putting it another way, if when we set off and specify, specified our maintained maximum value for lags in the model, and let's say that we specified that to be 10. If, in fact, we know that the maximum lag in the true model is 8, then what we've done in our original specification is include two redundant lags on all variables. In doing that, we're then able to say that the polynomial which operates on each of the variables have common factors. And the common factor they have is a common factor with a zero root. And so these tests are redundant. Any common factors of zero will be picked up in the common factor uh, which has been determined in R. So at the end of stage A, we know how many common factors there are, and we automatically know how many lags there are in the systematic form alpha of L. All that now remains is to determine how many of those common factors have non-zero roots. In other words, what is the order of the autoregressive process? So stage B tackles that problem. In stage B, we can write the polynomial row of L, which we've now determined to be of order R hat, as being equal to I is 1 to R hat 1 minus lambda I L. In other words, the product of the expressions involving the roots when the lambda i's I'm going to call roots, though strictly speaking they're the reciprocals of the roots of this of the characteristic equation for O of L. And what we now want to do is test how many of those lambda i's are significantly different from zero. And the way we can do that is to consider again a sequence of uniquely ordered hypotheses, the first of which is that the uh, coefficient rho at lag r hat is zero. If we don't reject that, we then consider the next hypothesis in the sequence. If we accept this first hypothesis, then we're saying that the order of the autoregression now is at most r hat minus 1. If we accept the second, we're saying that the order of the autoregression, or alternatively, the number of non-zero roots, is now at most r hat minus 2. And we can go through that sequence of hypotheses in the usual way. At the end of that, we've determined what I have to call R double hat. And unfortunately, because there are so many things going on, the notation does become very uh, complicated. And this now is the order of the autoregressive error process, or alternatively, the number of common factors without zero roots. Of necessity, that must be less than or equal to r hat. 
And what we now have, that is in fact the end of the two-stage procedure. What we have is that the order of dynamics common to all variables is equal to m hat by definition, which is m bar minus r hat plus r double hat. This first part represents the systematic dynamics, in other words, the dynamics in the alpha of L polynomials. And this final part represents the error dynamics, <coughs> which is the order of the autoregressive error process. And the maximal order of dynamics for any variable is equal to m with the bar above minus r hat plus r double hat. And again, this first part is the systematic dynamics, and the second is still the error dynamics. How can we effect this testing at stage B? Well, the testing here can be done by estimating a model of the form with r hat order autoregression and m bar minus r hat lags systematically included in the model, xt is equal to epsilon t. In other words, we can do that by autoregressive least squares. So that's least squares estimation, but with r hat order autoregressive error process, or more generally, by autoregressive instrumental variable estimation. But it's done for autoregression of order r hat. And from those estimates, you can test all the hypotheses in this sequence simply by testing the coefficient in the r hat order polynomial for the autoregression at the maximal order, then moving on to the next one and to the next one. And those are asymptotic t-tests. So that there's only one set of estimates that need to be generated. And you then go through sequentially applying these asymptotic t-tests. And that is one reasonable uh, procedure for determining the order of systematic and aerodynamics. I have to use the word reasonable because the tests at stage A and stage B are not independent. So that we can't argue that uh, overall we've used uh, a procedure analogous to the Anderson optimal sequential testing procedure. All that we can say is that the tests at stage A are of that form. They are uniformly most powerful. But because the tests at stage B are conditional on the result from stage A, though they are within uh, that conditioning uniformly most powerful, the conditioning means that overall the procedure can't be argued to be uniformly most powerful. <coughs> 
Another point to notice about this particular procedure is that if we want to allow the lags on different variables to differ, then the only way that comes about in this procedure is by our a priori specification that the maximal lags on different variables differ. There's no way in this procedure that we can determine what the maximal lag on each variable is separately. Or if we did attempt to modify this procedure to do precisely that, then what we come to is the second procedure, which I now want to discuss. And the second procedure, I want to subdivide into two sub-procedures, each of which is a two-stage procedure. The first one, I want to treat all variables alike. In other words, uh, restrict all variables to have the same length of lag, and that's all we're attempting to determine. That means that in previous notation, m bar j is in fact m bar for all j. And I want to present this case first to give you the structure of this procedure, and then to go to the more general one where we allow the mj bars to differ over j. Well, stage a in this procedure consists of determining the order of dynamics. That's m hat, which must be less than or equal to the pre-specified maintained maximum value m bar. Another consideration that uh, we might want to introduce, and in practice you would, is that you wouldn't leave uh, it possible that m hat, the order of dynamics that you determine empirically, can be zero. For many situations, you would want to specify some minimal order of dynamics to be determined at this first stage. And in particular, if you were using quarterly data, quarterly time series data, then it's quite likely that you would specify m star to be 4. So that for quarterly data, you would want, at the end of stage A, the order of dynamics to be determined to be at least 4. So that when you go on to stage B, which is in effect testing for common factors, uh, there is the possibility of there being common factors of up to order 4. So that what we're saying is that that should be less than or equal to m hat, which in turn is less than or equal to m bar. And that m hat is what we're wanting to determine. Well, again, not surprisingly, that this forms a uniquely ordered sequence of hypotheses. Uh, another way of looking at these procedures is that we are uh, rearranging the problem in such a way that the subproblems are uniquely ordered. And the particular form of the hypotheses here is that in the completely unrestricted model, when we estimate the thetas and include lags up to the maximum value of m bar, in determining the maximum lag in the model, the first hypothesis in the sequence is that all the coefficients at lag m bar are zero. If we don't reject that, we move on to the joint hypothesis that lags at both m bar and m bar minus 1 are zero. And so on through that sequence until we come down to m bar minus 1 through to m star plus 1 equals 0. The tests there, since these are all unrestricted linear models, 
but because they're dynamic models, could be chi-squared tests. But if we want to correct for degrees of freedom or correct for the overfitting of unrestricted models in small samples, we might use the conventional statistic which would have the F distribution if it wasn't a dynamic model and use that statistic as if it were distributed uh, according to the F distribution on the null hypothesis. So these hypotheses are quite easy to test. And again, notice the only model that we need to estimate is the completely unrestricted model. And from that, we can then test every hypothesis in this sequence. What we get at the end of stage A is the empirical value for the maximal lag, m hat. Stage B, we want to determine the number of common factors, or alternatively, the order of the autoregressive error process. And the hypotheses here cons correspond to, first of all, first order autoregression. If we don't reject that, we test whether there's another common factor, in other words, second order autoregression, through to the uh, most restricted case, which is that all the dynamics is caused by an m hat order autoregressive error process. Again, this is a uniquely ordered sequence of hypotheses, so we can use the sequential testing procedure. But notice, in doing that, we always maintain the overall number of legs in the model to be m hat. So as we vary the number of common factors, so we have to vary the number of lags occurring systematically in the model. As we increase the number of common factors, so we decrease the number of lags occurring in a systematic fashion in the model. And in that way, it ensures that the overall order of dynamics remains at m hat the sum of these two orders is, in fact, just m hat. From inspection of these hypotheses, and noting that I haven't, in fact, written the hypotheses that you have to test, because they are, again, the complicated nonlinear restrictions corresponding to the common factor restrictions, we can test all these hypotheses in the sequence using the CONFAC routine of Sargon. And so all we need for uh, the testing of these hypotheses are the unrestricted estimates of the thetas of order m hat. So we need those. Estimates. And those estimates are easily obtained either by ordinary least squares or instrumental variables. Once you've obtained those, you use the CONFACT routine, which tells you what the order of common factors is. So that's the second procedure when we restrict all variables to have a common lag. If we want to generalize that to allow variables to have different lags, then the whole structure of the procedure becomes that much more complicated. So B, when the M bar J are not necessarily all equal to a common m bar. 
stage A, instead of determining the common order of dynamics that is common to all variables, we now determine the maximal lag for each variable separately. And we do that, j is 1, 2, through to k plus 1. And there are going to be k plus 1 variables because we have the variable yt, the dependent variable, and the k variables in zt. But that is assuming that there are no redundant variables in zt. If any of the variables in zt are redundant when lagged, like the constant term, then uh, this maximum number here becomes smaller. But we can easily get rid of the constant term by measuring all the y's and the z's as deviations from the mean. But if we had seasonal dummy variables in the model, then we still have redundant variables, and we would have to allow for that in knowing how many of these mj hats there are. Well, it's a slight modification in the sequence of hypotheses that we need here. We now have to test whether the theta coefficient on the j variable at lag m bar j is equal to zero. If that's not rejected, we would then go on to the theta coefficient of the jth variable at lag m bar j being equal to that coefficient of the same variable at m j bar minus 1. So the structure of these hypotheses is just the same as the structure for case A, except that we're now only considering a scalar instead of a vector of coefficients and the subscript j to tells us which tells us which scalar out of that vector we're considering. And so for each variable j, we have this uniquely ordered sequence of hypotheses, so we can perform the optimal procedure. At the end of that, we've got mj hat for all j. But notice, the results we get for any one j are not independent of the results we've got for um, m i, when i is not equal to j. So when we're trying to determine what length of lag there is on the, any one variable, it's important how many lags we've included in the model on all other variables. And as we change the lags on other variables, so we can change the results of our testing on any particular variable. But the way this procedure is set up, you would, in fact, have um, the lags included on each variable specified by these mj bars. And so you estimate that model in its unrestricted form and then perform this sequence of t-tests on coefficients for each variable. What we then want, in order to de determine the number of common factors, is m hat as previously, but m hat is going to be the minimum over j of the mj hats. So that mj hat is the maximal lag that we've determined empirically on variable j. If what we now want to do is test for the number of common factors, we know that the number of common factors can't be greater than the minimum order of lag on any one variable. And so m hat is the minimum over j of the mj hat. As before, we then move on to stage b. But we only do this, of course, if m hat is, positive, is greater than 0. Uh, 
can never be negative. And so what we're saying is if m hat is in fact zero at stage a, at that point we know there can be no common factors. So if, I could, if m hat is zero, then we know r hat must be zero. There are no common factors. And we don't need to proceed to stage b. However, if m hat is 1 or greater, we proceed to stage b. And we look at the sequence corresponding to rho of l of order r hat. And it's r hat that we're wanting to determine. just as before. And the way we look at it is by considering r hat first 1, then 2, 3, down to m hat. So this would be h1, h2, and we go on through that sequence. Again, a uniquely ordered sequence. That again can be done using the COMFAC routine for the unrestricted estimates of theta. So all that's needed is either ordinary least squares or instrumental variable estimates of theta of order m hat, and then use COMFAC. Well, those are the procedures. Before I go on to illustrate the use of those, I should say something about the significance levels of the tests that you would use in these procedures. Let's first of all consider the second procedure of type A. In other words, that we're restricting the lags and all variables to be of the same order. Then at stage A, the probability of type 1 error, alpha subscript A, because all the tests in the sequence are independent is in fact 1 minus i going from 1 to m bar minus m star 1 minus epsilon i where the epsilon i's are the significance levels we use for each individual test in the sequence. In particular, if we set all the epsilons equal to a common epsilon, alpha in the first stage, probability of type 1 error, is equal to 1 minus 1 minus epsilon to the m bar minus m star. When we come to stage B, the probability of type 1 error, alpha B, is if we now again restrict the significance level for each individual test to be the same for all tests, equal to 1 minus 1 minus eta to the power m hat. And these powers, m hat and m bar minus m star, come from the maximum number of tests that we could perform in the sequence. So if we write out the sequence of hypotheses that we're going to consider, this is the maximum number or the total number of hypotheses in the sequence for stage A. 
the fact that in practice we might find a significant test before we got to the end of that sequence doesn't affect this calculation of the significance level overall. It's the fact that we are prepared to consider testing m bar minus m, m star hypotheses altogether that determines our significance level. Similarly for stage B, the number of tests that we could perform is in fact m hat. Which now does introduce a slight complication in that m hat is an empirically determined number. And if we're going to use that to determine or set the probability of type 1 error, we might be a little uneasy about it being empirically determined. So what we might do is replace that by the maximal value that m hat could take. And that, of course, is m bar minus m star. So that you do have a choice at that stage. And the reason why you have a choice is that m hat is empirically determined. There will be a probability that you've taken the wrong decision, a non-zero probability that you've taken the wrong decision on m hat. These are only the probabilities of type 1 error in each of the individual stages of the two-stage procedure. And if what we want to do is control the probability of type 1 error for the procedure as a whole, then that's slightly more complicated. And it's complicated because stage B is conditional on the results of stage A. And therefore, the two stages are not independent. And as a consequence, it's quite difficult to evaluate exactly what the probability of type 1 error is for the procedure as a whole. So at that stage, we can use the idea of the Bonferroni confidence intervals and put an upper bound on the probability of type 1 error for the procedure as a whole. And in particular, if we now denote by alpha without a subscript the probability of type 1 error for the procedure as a whole, then this is the probability of not making a type 1 error, 1 minus alpha. And from the previous discussion on Bonferroni intervals, we can ensure that that is at least e equal to some predetermined value p. And we choose p. And p is going to be equal to 1 minus alpha subscript A minus alpha subscript B. So that <coughs> we know that stage A and stage B are not independent. For each, we know the probability of type 1 error. We're going to take the probability of type 1 error for the two stages together as being the sum of those two separate probabilities. We know that that is going to overstate the probability of type 1 error. Therefore, we have this inequality, that the probability of not making a type 1 error for the procedure as a whole will be at least equal to uh, this level. So that if now, in practice, we were to choose, say, alpha A and alpha B, to be conventional 5% significance levels. It means that for the procedure as a whole, we're going to ensure that the probability of not making a type 1 error is at least 0.9, or putting it another way, significance level of 10%. Once we've set alpha A and alpha B at uh, 0.05, we can go back to these expressions and find out what eta and epsilon have to be in order to ensure that alpha A is 0.05 and alpha B is 0.05. And if we take the case where 
m bar minus m star is in fact 4, which will occur in the example I want to discuss. The epsilon value has to be 0 0.01 to 8. So that because we would usually be using a two-sided test, we would be interested in epsilon upon 2, which is approximately 0 0.01. And so we're using a 1% significance level for each of the individual tests to give us 10% significance for the procedure as a whole. In the particular case where the number of tests possible in each sequence is 4. Well, just to prove that the theory in this area can be quite complicated, if you weren't already convinced of that, if we now go on to the case where we consider procedure 2 of type B, the whole situation is much more complicated. I won't spell it out in all its detail, but the main point is for procedure 2 of type B in stage A, we have many more sequences of hypotheses that we should, we're testing. And when we consider any individual variable in isolation, we have a sequence there of independent test statistics. And so for the tests on any individual variable, we can evaluate the probability of type 1 error because all the test statistics in the sequence are independent. But when we want to get an overall probability of type 1 error for stage A, we then have to combine some way all the probabilities of type 1 error for all variables J. They're not independent, and so we have the, exactly the same problem that we had in combining stage A and stage B previously. So again, we can use the Bonferroni result and uh, increase the size of our confidence intervals. As a consequence of that, for reasonable values of k, that's the number of variables in the regression, the size of the confidence intervals becomes very large. The implication of that is that you're not likely to reject the restricted model. So in particular, at stage A, the order of dynamics, which is what you're attempting to determine at stage A, which remember in the four procedures of type B, is the minimum over J of the MJ hat. This, in general, is going to tend to be uh, biased towards zero. Not biased in a statistical sense. It's just that we're going to observe very low values for m hat. Because what we're doing all the time is widening the confidence intervals. Well, what might we do about that? Because if at stage A we are going to end up with the order of dynamics, common to all variables being very low, there's very little chance at stage B 
of pulling out common factors and getting autoregressive error processes. Well, there are two things we could do. First of all, we might increase our pre-selected overall probability of type 1 error. In the discussion for the simple case over here, I chose 10% which is larger than a conventional significance level, but still quite low, we might start using 20% or 30% as our probability of type 1 error for the procedure as a whole. And that could be reasonable in this particular context because type 1 error is that of rejecting restricted models. And if we want to ensure that the probability of type 1 error remains very small, then we are going to accept restricted models, which means that it's quite possible that we're going to accept a model which is more restricted than the model needed. The consequence of that is inconsistency in estimation of the parameters. If we've omitted relevant lags on variables, then the resulting parameter estimates will be inconsistent. If we increase the probability of type 1 error, then what we're doing is forcing the procedure now to include more lags. And if that results in a mistake, in other words, if we accept a model that's more general than the model that's needed, then the only consequence of that is lack of efficiency, but not inconsistency. So at that point, we have to decide which we believe is more important, and which costs are greater, whether the costs of inconsistency are greater than the costs of inefficiency. And this way out of the problem is an argument which says that inconsistency is, in fact, uh, more serious than inefficiency. And I hope it's no surprise that the second route out of the problem would be to use an explicit loss function. And if it were a quadratic loss function, that would be combining the inconsistency and inefficiency in the same function. There are just two more points before we get on to the application. First one is a further problem. And this problem arises if, when we find there are common factors, some of the roots for that characteristic polynomial are complex. And in particular, if we found that there are four common factors, or alternatively, there's a fourth order autoregressive error process, and all the roots are complex, so that we've got rho of order 4 of L is now 1 minus lambda 1 L, 1 minus lambda 2 L, 1 minus lambda 4 L. And we're saying that lambda 1 through to lambda 4 are complex. What happens if we test the hypothesis that R equals 1? Well, the answer is that with a very high probability, you will reject a common factor of order 1. Because this test of a common factor, a single common factor, is a test based on an estimated root which will be real. If, in fact, the true model has all complex roots, 
then with a very high probability you will reject this hypothesis. Which seems to be uh, a serious problem because there are many situations where you would expect to get <coughs> complex roots. Well, a solution to that one is for the hypotheses which previously were that R is 1, and then the second hypothesis corresponded to R being 2, R is 3, and so on, instead of that sequence, because this first test runs the risk of encountering this problem, we have double increments. And so we would first of all test R equals 2. Secondly, we would test R equals 4, R equals 6, and so on. And the reason why that gets around the problem is that whenever we pull out two roots, if they are complex, we'll pull them out as complex conjugates. And so these tests will then be valid. The only remaining problem is that in this procedure, you're unable to determine an odd order for the number of common factors. So that if we were going through this sequence and R is in fact 5, we would find that 4 is acceptable, but 6 is rejected. So what we have to do is supplement this testing procedure by as soon as we find a significant test in uh, double steps, we then go back one to test whether we need the intermediate one. And we know at that stage that that final one, if it exists, can't be a complex root. So that if we rejected 6 but accepted 4, we would then test r equals 5. And the reason why that root can't be complex is that if it were complex, there must be another complex root somewhere, and therefore we would have accepted 6. The final problem is that if a set of restrictions phi of theta equals 0, and R is now denoting the number of restrictions are satisfied, if they're true, and we test phi with R star restrictions of theta when R star is less than R, and we're considering an ordered sequence of hypotheses. In other words, we know that a more restricted case, and this is in fact true. Then, the probability of phi for the R star restrictions as a function of the unrestricted estimate, not surprisingly, is zero. Those restrictions are satisfied. But also, the probability limit of the derivative of those restrictions evaluated at the unrestricted estimates of theta with respect to theta is also zero. The consequence of that is that in constructing the Wald test statistic, which has the form phi of theta transpose into j v of theta j transpose inverse phi of theta hat when j is that derivative matrix d phi d theta which means that <coughs> if we are considering a set of restrictions R star in number, which is less than the set R, uh, which are true, then in computing this statistic, we're going to get 
um, a Jacobian matrix, J, which has got a probability limit of zero. And so the danger we're running is that this matrix is going to be singular. And we can't compute this statistic. However, in practice, what's been found to be true is that the phi of theta functions approach zero more quickly than the uh, derivative matrix approaches zero. So that you are able to compute a number for this uh, test statistic, but because these are approaching zero very quickly, and more quickly than the derivatives, it's a low value for the statistic, and therefore you don't reject the hypothesis, which is the correct decision. Alternatively, if in using the, uh, for example, the COMFAC routine, which is computing test statistics of this form, you get the error message which tells you that this matrix is singular, then the interpretation of that is that a more restricted model than the one you're considering is valid. Well, I want now to discuss the application. And the application is the demand for consumer durables, as opposed to non-durables, which I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture in Canada. The demand for durables is the expenditure on durable goods, which is denoted by C. The potential explanatory variables that are used are a gross domestic product, or income variable Y, and a price variable P. And the price variable is, in fact, the price of durables relative to the price of non-durables. To allow for possible heteroscedasticity caused by uh, population changes, in fact, the consumer expenditure is per capita and the income variable is per capita. The data <coughs> is such that we have 56 observations from the first quarter of 1961. But the last six are retained for forecasting checks of the stability of the model. So that, in fact, there are, uh, we don't have to deduct that 6 from this 56. We have 56 observations which we use to estimate, and a further 6 beyond that. We then want to look at relationships of the form alpha of L into C is some constant plus beta of L into Y plus gamma of L into P plus some error term. And the problem then is to determine the order of these light polynomials. Well, for this particular data, which is quarterly data, the maintained maximum lag was specified to be 8. The minimum lag that I wanted to come out of stage A is set at 4, because it's quarterly data. And the procedure 
that was used is both procedure two of type A and procedure two of type B. The exercise was performed for models in this form, which are the levels of consumption income and the relative price, and also for the logs of those variables. And the results are on the handout. And you see on the handout that for the procedure of type A, where the lags on all variables are restricted to be the same, at stage A, when M bar was set at 8 and M star at 4, M hat was determined to be 4 for levels. And the F statistic is quoted. For logs, you get the same decision that M hat is equal to 4. So that for this procedure, type A stage A gives M hat equals 4 when M bar has been set at 8 and the minimal order M star at 4. What we then have to do, because M hat is greater than 0, we can now test for common factors or test for that dynamics being represented or ge generated by autoregressive error processes. So we move to stage B. And the tests there have been uh, performed using the COMFAC routine. And you'll find that we have the test statistics using the single increments in R and the test statistics using the double increments in R in case any of the routes are complex. For the levels results at stage B, you find that for small r equals 1, which is a common fact, one common factor, which for this model implies capital R, the number of restrictions, equal to 2. And that follows from the number of variables involved in the model. The test statistic is denoted by S. And that S means that uh, the singular message, singular matrix message, came out of the compact routine, which we interpret to mean that a more restricted model than this one is valid. And that happens for all hypotheses down to R equals 3. We're still getting the singular matrix. As soon as we go to the maximum value of R that we can test, because M hat is 4, we get a test statistic for levels of 29.59. And that still has two degrees of freedom. So that asymptotically, the test statistic that we've evaluated there has a chi-squared distribution with two degrees of freedom and is clearly significant at all uh, conventional significance levels and all significance levels that we're likely to use on the basis of that analysis. So that we can reject that the fourth order dynamics in the model has been generated by a fourth order autoregressive error process using this procedure for levels. If you look at the other side of the handout, you find that the same result is true for this model when the C, the Y, and the P are the logs of the corresponding variable. So that as a result of using procedures of type 2 and type A, we have that the order of dynamics is 4, and we've got the possibility that the number of common factors could be 3. Well, what happens if we use procedure of type 2 subtype capital B? In other words, allow each variable to have its lag determined separately. Well, to do that, we have to perform 
a series of t-tests on the lag coefficients of each variable separately. And if you look at the handout, the result for levels is that none of the lags on the price variable are significantly different from zero. So that the order of dynamics on price at stage A um, is zero. Therefore, the order of dynamics overall has got to be zero. And as a consequence, stage B for levels is now redundant. There can't be any common factors because the only price variable that comes into the model is that of the current price. If we look at the logs results, then we find that for consumption and price, there are significant lags at four periods, and for income, significant lags at three periods. However, because M star has been specified to be four, in other words, the minimal order of dynamics that we're prepared to consider is four, and because y has only got the, non -sig the significant coefficient at three, we don't need to go on to uh, stage B. And the conclusion from those applications of the procedure of type two A and B is that the models, either in logs or levels, have fourth order dynamics. And we're not sure about whether that can be represented by an autoregressive error process, but if it can, it's unlikely to be represented by an autoregressive error process of higher order than three. And at the bottom of that page, I've given you the results for the model with four period lags on all variables in levels and in logs. And if you look at those, you'll find that the goodness of fit at 0.99 is um, extremely good for both equations. But that's a common situation with time series, and we have to look at more discriminating statistics. The other statistics that are given are the Durbin-Watson statistic, which for levels at 1.54 and logs 1.71 are non-informative because they're in the inconclusive region but this is a dynamic model, and so the statistic is not going to help us in that situation. The chi-squared statistic with six degrees of freedom is the chi-squared statistic testing whether the parameters have been stable from the sample period and into the forecast period, so that we have six observations in the forecast period. And so we can use the parameter estimates from the sample period to generate forecasts for consumption in those six periods. We happen to have the observed values for each of the consumptions in those forecast periods. We can now compare those forecasts with the actual. And if we take the sum of the forecast errors, squared, i is going from 1 to 6, and then compare that to the error variance estimated in the sample period, this statistic asymptotically will have a chi-squared distribution with six degrees of freedom if the error variance in the forecast period is the same as the error variance in the sample period, which in turn means that the parameters are the same uh, in the forecast period and the sample period. We're looking at the values we've got for that statistic for levels and logs, uh, we find that we reject the hypothesis of parameter stability. <laughs>
The final statistic there that's given is Q12, and that's the Box and Pierce portmanteau test statistic when we've summed 12, the first 12 of the simple um, serial correlations of the residuals. And if the residuals were white noise, that would be asymptotically distributed as a chi-squared with uh, at most 12 degrees of freedom. We need to adjust that. But the message is clear from those computed statistics that um, we're not rejecting the null hypothesis uh, for those two models. The other interesting thing is to look at the long-run elasticities of consumption with respect to income. And both for levels and logs, the long-run elasticity of consumption with respect to income is of the order of 1.3. And the price elasticity in the long run is for levels minus 1.3 and for uh, logs minus 0.65. all of which are reasonable. So it does look as though a model with four period lags is going to perform quite well. But we have found that the model isn't stable. So our next um, stage in the exercise is to search for better models than these simple models. And the reason why we have to do that is that these procedures of type 1 and 2 are purely mechanical statistical procedures. And we should never expect purely mechanistic procedures to produce a totally sensible result in the end. And what we should now do is attempt to use economic theory to specify models which we hope are going to outperform the models resulting from the mechanical statistical procedure. And that is, in fact, what we find uh, in the next set of models, which I'll discuss at the beginning of the next lecture. <laughs>